very early on and developed this very deep interest in uh, Eastern religions, uh, especially in Buddhism, um, Hinduism, and, and Islam. I was brought up in a Catholic uh, family. I mean, there's four great personalities in my life, uh, really, um, which is basically Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad. So during my 20s, um, I moved to uh, Paris uh, to study at the Sorbonne. Um, I live among Sikhs and, um, you know, and I'm very grateful for, for this experience, which actually taught me so much. Community, religious communities very often have a tendency to be uh, centered around identity and people like me who like to explore different religions uh, and who are into arts and so on and so forth are not particularly welcome. Who has a certain taste for metaphysics, um, you know, the, the path of the, uh, the path of the Ahlul Bayt has, uh, has a lot to offer, definitely. Over time, I've become very skeptical of, of the way we divide the world into okay, Muslims on one hand, hand and then these other religions. Our access to knowledge is, is tainted by biases, by whatever we've been taught in our, in our childhood, but whatever experience we have. You're praying within a building that reeks of mysticism. And even though you might not be rationally conscious of it, your unconscious is drinking at fun by the sheer act of, you know, worshipping in that, in that mosque. And when a civilization can do that, then yes, that's, um, you know, that's, that very few traditions can, 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 can do that. Uh, 14 centuries of Islamic civilization were not good enough to give us a building with an Islamic type of architecture in which we could have this discussion. And likewise for the clothes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, Today we are interviewing Dr. Francisco Jos Luis from Luxembourg, who is currently living in Iraq in Baghdad. And he has a PhD in the study of religions from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. So welcome and salam alaikum, Doctor. Walaikum salam. Thank you. Um, first of all, tell us about your journey in life and in religion studies and later on in Islamic and Irfani and Shi'i studies. How come you reached to the status that you are in? Uh, tell us from the beginning uh, your journey and your search about religions uh, until you studied your PhD and until now. So I was, uh, I was born in Luxembourg from, um, in a family of uh, working class Portuguese immigrants. Um, and I was very fortunate to basically grow up in an environment where uh, from the get go I had to, you know, handle four languages right from the very start because Luxembourg has three official languages that everyone that goes through the schooling system has to learn um, and as well as basically my native tongue which is uh, which is Portuguese um, I would I would consider myself I mean although Portuguese is uh, my native tongue I think that the, the, the language I'm uh, more at ease uh, is, is uh, along with Portuguese would be would be, would be French. So I, you know, after pro, my after primary school, um, and then uh, I went to a classical uh, secondary school. So in the, the Luxembourg schooling system in those days still followed the old um, the old school Jesuit type of education. So um, I was very fortunate uh, as a working class kid to be able to learn uh, Latin for um, over seven years and uh, in secondary school and then later on Greek as well. So I came out of the Luxembourg schooling system with, with a, a very solid um, classical education and, and uh, with the ability to really appreciate the beauty of um, 
of my parents' heritage, um, not just my Portuguese heritage, but also because Luxembourg was a, was a Catholic country in those days, um, to appreciate the depth of uh, Catholic culture, which, you know, still to this day, I, 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 I still appreciate. Um, I was also able to um, basically uh, learn classical music, so I had a, a very thorough um, I had a very thorough classical training in, 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 in uh, a very thorough training in, in classical music and in the history of art as well. So I, I played several instruments uh, um, and I played in classical orchestras as well. Uh, whilst you know, whilst I was in, in secondary school as well. So uh, all in all, I think that I was you know very much blessed with with growing up in a country that was extremely that in those days was still very conservative. And we had, in those days, we had a, we had a, we had a our ruler, I mean, Luxembourg is a monarchy, it's our ruler, Grand Duke um, Jean, was, um, was a role model for the nation because um, he, he was one of the very few heads of state that actually um, uh, was present on D-Day. Uh, he was an he was an officer in the British Army, and uh, he he fought against the Nazis, of course, and he freed our country. So, uh, and the, the the beautiful thing about my my youth is that my my childhood is that I, I was able to grow up with our, a lot of people who had experienced um, the the terrible tragedy of uh, Nazi occupation. I was also you know and and to learn basically what, what it meant to live under a totalitarian system. And, um, you know, we also have had people experience with people who actually went through the concentration camps. And at the same time, I think what was also really great in my youth, my childhood, and, you know, my, 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 especially my secondary school training is that I was fortunate to, to, to experience uh, what it meant to have teachers who had a, a full classical culture so many of my teachers besides greek and latin also uh, explored other languages so uh, for example my last year of secondary school um i was able to learn sanskrit uh, from my greek teacher so on, on on saturday on saturdays i would go to his house and for free he would teach me uh, sanskrit uh, other other colleagues of here is um who also taught latin uh, were experts in um, Chinese and Tibetan. Um, my Greek teacher himself was a, was a, was a, an expert of um, classical Japanese as well. So I grew up in an environment where I think you know, um, even though the new generation of teachers had come, who had brought you know were brought up in the sixties and had started the destruction of classical Western culture, I was still. I was still very fortunate to experience the, the you know, the, the, the last years of, of when it was still possible to, uh, to have a, um, a good classical, uh, classical education. So I'm, I'm very fortunate and, and, and I'm, I think I feel blessed to have had, to have had such uh, amazing teachers. And I think, you know, I was a very, I was a very curious kid. Um, and um, I think, uh, very early on, I developed this very deep interest in uh, Eastern religions, uh, especially in Buddhism, um, Hinduism, and and Islam. So throughout my teenage years, I would spend my uh, my pocket money in um, basically buying books on on these different religious traditions. And I think in those years already, I, I developed a, a great deal of love and respect for uh, you know. Um, Lord Buddha, um, Krishna, but also Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. And I think that has basically, I mean, there's four great personalities in my life, uh, really, um, which is basically Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad. And, um, and that has sort of remained this way in, in, in my life. I was, I was brought up in a Catholic uh, family. Um, and I, I would say I was, I was pretty much religious. Um, this, and I think that much of that has remained with me. Uh, I'm still a very staunch um, pro-lifer. 
um, and I'm a very ardent defender of the traditional family. And these are things, and also um, a defender of the rights of the working class, according to the doctrines of the 19th century, um, you know, anti-modern popes like, um, you know, Pope Pius X or Leo XIII, who, um, who really uh, we established the, uh, the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. That has really remained with me. My, my father was a, uh, was a war veteran, um, was a Portuguese war veteran who fought against the, the communists in Africa. And um, so this tradition of anti-communism has, um, you know, remained in our, in our, in our family. And, uh, you know, at the same time, my father was deeply involved in defending the rights of the working class. He was a, he was, um, he was, a, a, he was a, 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 a,
as a Muslim, I, I, I pray the Jafri way, but I'm not, um, I would not consider myself part of a particular community as such, um, especially because living here in Iraq um, and noticing what sectarianism has done to this country, I, I don't like the sort of label of uh, Shia, Sunni, whatever. I, I think it's, um, you know, when one recognizes what damage it has done to this country, and uh, and how it affects people's lives. Uh, I just, you know, I'm just I'm just a Muslim, and I pray the Jafari way. That's it. Um, I think the title Shia is something that only the Imam of the time is um, entitled to basically give upon someone. Uh, I think um, Salman al Muhammadi was a Shia because the Imam said so. Um, as for me, I just I don't know. I don't, know, I don't know if the imam at the time considers me one of his Shia. Uh, so I'm just, uh, I'm just a Muslim. I, I, would, um, I would not dare um, usurp um, the title, title of Shia for myself. If other people are happy doing that, that's their problem. But I'm just, uh, I, I, I very cautiously refrain from it. And also because uh, I'm, I'm not a community person. Uh, I, I don't like, um, um, and I think it's not just in the Shia community. I think that in all communities that I've interacted with, uh, community, religious communities very often have a tendency to be uh, centered around identity. And when they're centered around identity, then they become very insecure. And people like me who like to explore different religions uh, and who are into arts and so on and so forth are not particularly welcome. So it, it's, uh, it's uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I pray, I fast, uh, you know, I practice at home basically. I do the ziyarah of the imams, but I try not to get too involved within with with certain um, you know religious circles, especially also because um, many of these circles are involved with with politics and. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just a, a Portuguese uh, working class kid and it's none of my business to get involved in political affairs that I'm, I have nothing to do with. A very interesting experience that you just shared in maybe 15 or 20 minutes, but I want to ask more about um, uh, what's the issue that uh, made you change or convert or choose uh, Islam among all the other religious experiences that you've encountered? Hinduism, you mentioned Buddhism, Sikhism, um, and the Catholic Christian background, w w w uh, Catholic Christian background, which is full of uh, spirituality. And as you said, that you still uh, respect and understand the deep uh, spiritual essence of Christianity. So there was uh, something that pushed you to convert. Uh, well, actually, yes, I, 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 I had a, uh, I had an experience. Um, uh, I mean, dreams are very important in my, in my, in my life. And so I had this very, uh, I had this very intense, um, dream where I was basically shown that, you know, this was the, the step that I should take, especially because I was in a sort of in between uh, space. Uh, on the one hand, I had this very sort of, um, how to put it, I had this sort of neo-Vedantic way of looking at things, which is that, you know, all religions lead to the same goal. On the other hand, I had um, this uh, one person who was, um, you know, who um, who died um, and through his death made a very clear statement about uh, the truth that he, of, that he manifested in his, in his, in his being. And um, so this dream experience I had, um, you know, uh, basically solved it for me. Um, and so, so that is why I took that decision. Uh, it's not, it's, so it's not something that came from me it's something that was basically, I think, was uh, inspiration from, you know, some other place. And that uh, prompted me to, to do my, my shahada. Um, and yeah, 
And, and, and I think spiritually speaking, I've noticed the difference. Um, uh, subst- I mean, there were substantial changes that happened. And I think that spiritually speaking, um, you know, um, I think was the best, the best thing that, that I could have done in terms of getting, um, coming closer to God. Uh, but of course, um, uh, I mean, the way I entered, or the way I discovered Shiism was through the writings of Henri Corbin. And Henri Corbin, uh, you know, Henri Corbin's Shiism, or the, the Shiism that he describes is that of the Arafah and the, and the, and the uh, philosophers. Uh, it's not the, the, the Shiism of the masses and um, of the Fuqaha and of the different communities. And I think, um, and that is something I was, not, I was not really prepared for. I mean, although I had notions that there was this huge difference, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difference that I managed to basically uh, deal with in my own sort of way uh, over time. But, uh, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's more than just a dream, it's a grace, it's a message from God, it's something like Ilham which you felt, because uh, yeah. a person like you who thinks and practices all different religions can't rely on such a, on, on only a dream to change, it, it was something that... No, I mean, I, I, I had studied, uh, I had studied Islam very thoroughly, way before my, my conversion, I'm, uh, I mean, my Muslim friends were always very... Uh, astonished that I knew so much about Islam, that I love the Prophet. Uh, I mean, I would go to, I mean, even before becoming a Muslim, I used to attend the Majalis of uh, doing, doing, doing Muharram. Um, I would attend Sufi meetings for the, 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 the Mawlid of uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi So it's not, uh, I, I was very well aware of, of, of uh, you know, I, I, you know, as um, I was ve- well read into into Islamic uh, studies, uh, I, I and especially Sufism, and so uh, I'd studied, you know, very well before um, converting. So it was an informed uh, choice, at least in terms of the the great heritage of the Islamic tradition. Um, so I was, you know, as, as uh, and I think that the what is so what is beautiful about the the uh, you know the, the the teachings of the Ahl Bayt is that they present a very elegant uh, theological and philosophical and mystical system, uh, and that is uh, you know after having studied um, Vedanta and um, Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism and Kashmiri Shaivism, it's, it's I mean it's uh, it's a very sophisticated. Um, you know, it's a very sophisticated um, school. And I think that with someone with an intellectual, uh, you know, bent of mind who, 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 um, who has a certain taste for metaphysics, um, you know, the, the path of the, uh, the, the Ahl-Bayt has, uh, has a lot to offer, definitely. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, here I can impose an important question because... Um, uh, many scholars say that different religions uh, include uh, wisdom, beauty, virtues, uh, truth. So uh, what did you find that the value added that makes Islam superior or uh, maybe the, 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 has a more beautiful image than other uh, religions? Um, it's a, how to put it? I think it's the, 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 the problem here is, I mean, when we speak of other religions, it's that um, it's not so much a question of either Islam or other religions, first of all, because uh, religious experience is, is very varied and, and, and it's very difficult to put all other religions in sort of the same category. Uh, different religions, basically, uh, religions have very different um, functions. 
Um, I think one thing that uh, a lot of Muslims don't understand is, for example, religion in Japan is articulated in a very, very different way than it is in the Middle East. So I have one of my students who, who studies, now, a Pakistani student who, who lives in Japan, and he tells me it's, it's just astonishing. People in Japan uh, have a deep sense of spiritual things, but they... They, they, but a lot of them would not consider themselves to be part of a religion. And it has to do with the fact that Japanese religion, well, Japanese religiosity does not articulate itself in the same way that Islam does. For example, uh, when you get married in Japan, you get married into a, uh, into a Shinto shrine. And when you die, you, you die as a Buddhist. And, uh, but really, the over if one were to really take Buddhism you know, in, in a sort of literal way, a very, very tiny number of, of people in Japan actually would be Buddhist because being a Buddhist means that you uh, make allegiance to, you take refuge uh, in the Sangha, the community, the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha and the Buddha himself. And very few people do that. Uh, so the problem is that um, the question is, it, it does not take into account the complexity of religious experience. That's one thing. The other thing, and I think that's a, a point that Jordan Peterson uh, also makes as well, is that, um, well, what does it mean to believe in a religion? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, making a statement that one, acquiesces to a certain number of doctrines. Um, does that mean, I mean, does, does that mean that you embody those, 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 um, those values, really? And over time, I've become very skeptical of, of the way we divide the world into, okay, Muslims on one hand, hand and then these other religions. So um, what I tr try to do is, Instead of approaching the question of like, okay, we have Islam and these other religions, I try to go back to what the Imams told us, which is that we are all trapped in a cosmic war between the armies of the Aql and the armies of Jahal. And uh, the armies of the Aql have the, these different soldiers, which is, you know, goodness, mercy, courage. Uh, purity and so, and so forth. Then the the army of the uh, the armies of Jahal of ignorance have these other soldiers, and I try to look at things that way. And so, for example, if someone tells me, you know, uh, I I don't look at the label that people give themselves, uh, whether they say I'm a Muslim or a Buddhist or I'm an atheist. I I don't look at that. I look at what uh, the person embodies in their daily lives if they are part of the army of the Aql or they would be part of the army of the of Jahal. Um, because at the end of the day, the, the other problem, of course, is that, you know, um, as we know from, 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 from Kalam, I mean, God judges people according to, according to their knowledge. And access to knowledge of real Islam is despite of the media and despite of the ability to, uh, to transmit that, it's very difficult nowadays because uh, first of all, um, our access to knowledge is, is tainted by biases, by whatever we've been taught in our, in our childhood, but whatever experience we have. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's difficult to make judgments like that. So I tend to look at it from that point of view. And I think that the way Henri Corbin looked at the term Shia uh, is very helpful in the sense that he viewed the term Shia to mean that people are initiated into the spiritual realities. And as we know from the Hadith of the Ahl Bayt, the, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the, the hearts of the Mu'minin, uh, he made them from the same clay, uh, the celestial clay, than the bodies of the, of the, of the Masumin. So, 
you know, a, a, a person like that may be born in a Muslim family, but might as well just also be a Buddhist or whatever. I think that's, these are labels, really. Um, you know, so, 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 I mean, how do I deal, for example, with people, uh, great Japanese masters like uh, Kobo Daishi, uh, Kyukai, or uh, Master Dogen, who, you know, most probably didn't know about Islam, but who brought amazing spiritual teachings. Uh, a lot of them re that resonate with, with, with the teachings of the, uh, of the Ahu Bayt. Um, I mean, especially Master Dogen has uh, passages from his Shobogendo that resonate with so many of the sayings of Imam Ali. So how do I deal with that, right? So, so, so I think it's... Um, I don't like to, 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 to look at this question in terms of, okay, there's Islam and there's other religions. I, I like to take a more cosmic uh, view of things and, and, and more, look more into the ideas of, okay, esoteric, exoteric, and, uh, and also the idea of embodying the, uh, the, 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 being an embodiment of the, uh, of the armies of the intellect. And that, I think, helps me, um, you know, helps me look at things differently. And um, because, for example, uh, the Sikh tradition has um, the, the 10th master of the Sikh tradition in, his sec in, his, in the book that he's written called the Dasan Granth has passages in it that could be interpreted as blasphemous regarding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and Imam Mahdi Okay, so how, what do I do with it? So how do I do with it when I deal with, 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 with Sikhs, right? Um, okay, just because the 10th master wrote this, are all of them aware of this? I, I'm, in my experience, I think 99% of them are not even aware of that. Um, I think mo the overwhelming majority of Sikhs that I've, I've known are, are, are not ver very well read into their own religious tradition. And I think that's the case of most people in, in any religion. Uh, so, okay, so that, that's, you know, okay, they don't know about this. So I'm going to tell you a story. I, I, so when I lived in the UK, I, lived, I, 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 I used to know this, um, this lady um, who I called, you know, auntie basically and uh so um she was she was the mother of uh she, also, she was the, the aunt of of, uh, of someone i knew very well so from time to time i'd you know I'd, I'd go and visit her and with her very broken english she told me this she told me um you know one morning um i was reciting this prayer and then suddenly I saw light everywhere and the light outside was the light inside and the light inside was the light outside. Okay. So this was a Sikh lady and she was, you know, uh, she's probably one of the sweetest and um, most honest people that I've ever met in my life. And I have no reason to doubt that what she said was, was, was not truthful. She actually asked me not to repeat it to other people. So there was no, there was no desire. She was a very sort of self-effaced, uh, you know, sort of person. And she was not seeking after publicity. And this, she just was said in, 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 in sort of, in a, almost in secrecy. So what do, how, you know, what, I mean, this is, you know, this is a mystical experience, you know. And uh, so what do I do with it? I mean, am I, am I just going to, am I, are we just basically supposed to brush this away because this person does not believe that, you know, a certain number of group, a certain group of 14 people who lived, you know, 14 centuries ago were divinely appointed by God to be, you know, it's, it's difficult, right, to, 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 to judge the experiences of other people according to their standards. So, um, so yeah, and that is why I don't look so much into systems. Uh, for me, 
uh, in my own sort of personal experience, the thing that decided it uh, was the personality of uh, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, who, um, you know, uh, is, um, whose, uh, whose sacrificial death in, 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 in Karbala, I think, um, you know, someone... Because here's the thing, uh, Imam Hussein makes a certain number of claims about himself, right? Uh, and there's two, there's two possibilities. I mean, Thomas Aquinas uh, uses the argument as well. There's two possibilities. Either that person is telling the truth or that person is evil. And if that person is evil, then we have to reject... Uh, his teachings, and of course, when when one looks into the life of that that particular person, uh, one can find nothing but you know nobility, uh, um, outright nobility, and so uh, and the fact that he was ready to basically you know put his life on the line for that is uh, you know it's 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 very decisive for me at least was extremely decisive. So I, 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 I'm very, I mean, although I'm an academic and someone with an intellectual bent of mind, uh, I also know that being in love with one's own reason is, um, it's very seductive and it's very dangerous as well because it's, uh, being in love with your own intelligence is extremely dangerous. So I tend not to look so much into systems because systems can be extremely seductive uh i tend to look in the way they are actually being applied and this is where my my interest for islamic art becomes very important i think that islam as a as a civilization because it's not really just a religion it's also a civilization has brought about some of the most uh amazing arts um, in, in, in ever producing human history. And it's, it's an art that appeals to the celestial and that ennobles the, the human being. And, uh, you know, and I can never get enough of it. And I think, um, you know, I, I, the, the art of a civilization tells you is actually the real legacy of the civilization. Uh, not political systems, um, you know, not even theological systems. Because if you look at it, the first great commentators uh, of Islamic, of the Islamic traditions were not uh, people who wrote, uh, you know, tafasir or, or collected hadith. Um, it's, you know, the, the people who, um, I mean, as I always provocatively, be, as I always provocatively say, uh, the first great example of a theological commentary of the Quran is the, uh, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And these are architects who, uh, you know, created this building and through the geometry and the architectural structure of the building and the way they built it, they made a specific statement about, about a particular event uh, in the Quran and uh, actually linked several passages of the Quran with this, with this event as well. And, um, you know, made a statement about what the core of Islam actually is. And that's way before the first compilations of, um, of hadith are being, you know, are being produced. I mean, it's, it's way before Sunnism or Shiism was, were, were ever codified during the Abbasid period. So this is, this, I think it's very important. I think very often we completely dismiss this question. You know, and I know, the overwhelming majority of people don't read hadith books, uh, don't read books on Arfan and so on and so forth. But most people visit mosques. Uh, and in Qom, uh, apart from the Shana Hadith Masuma, just in front of it, you have the, uh, the mosque of Imam Hassan al-Askari. Most of Imam Hassan al-Askari has this specificity that it has the entirety of the Qur'an written on its walls, the interior and external walls. And it's a theological statement. Because what you're doing is you're praying within a three-dimensional Qur'an. 
And this Quran is not just the Quran that you see on paper, but is the you know it's the Kitab al Mubin. It's the uh, and it's 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 sort of it's sort of the uh, you know archetype, the divine archetype that brings the world into existence as well. So even without reading on mysticism, you are you're praying within a building that reeks of mysticism. And even though you might not be rationally conscious of it, your unconscious is drinking at fun by the sheer act of, you know, worshipping in that, in that mosque. And that is, that is extremely important. And when a civilization can do that, then yes, that's, um, you know, that's, that very few traditions can, 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 can do that. Mm-hmm. So you believe that there is a great relation, connection between art and the depth of the art or maybe spiritual art and between the religious ideas or religious realities? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, depending on the traditions, yes. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, in Islam, uh, most definitely. Because the, uh, you know, the first architect of Islam is the Prophet. He, he, he's the builder of the first mosque. And the mosque is built in a very specific way. Um, the, the first mosque in Medina is, um, attempts to replicate the tabernacle of Bani Israel in the desert. And because of this, there are very, one has to be aware of Jewish tradition. The tabernacle was built in such a way that you have the, the place where, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant was, was kept, where only the high priest would enter during Yom Kippur. Then you had a space that was reserved for the priests, and then a space that was reserved for the Israelites, and then outside was basically the place where, you know, women could, could you know, could, could enter as well. Now... So here's really important that uh, so a priest, what is a priest? A priest is someone who offers sacrifice. Now, if you look at the, the, the first mosque, that division between the priests and the rest of Bani Israel is abolished. What this means is that every single Muslim has, um, has the sacrificial dimension to him or her. We're all able to offer sacrifice. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a, ch- a very interesting and very important change that takes place, which is that the, the Muslim in essence has a sacerdotal as a priestly function. Um, so it's, 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 so it's not like in, 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 in the, the old religion of the Aban Israel where, you know, people would delegate the function of the priest to the, the, the Levites. The, 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 you know, the, the, the tribes of the tribe of the priests, everyone is basically a Levite. And that implies a whole, uh, a complete change in how the, 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 uh, the particular, this particular tradition is, is, is lived. So that in and of itself, you know, translates the idea that the prophet was very well, um, very, well aware, very well aware of what he was doing when he was building the mosque. And also the fact that uh, the, the, so the, the, the place where the Ark of the Covenant is, uh, is kept is basically corresponds to the Mehrab, basically. And, uh, and as you know, the, when, when, uh, when, you know, Hadad Musa, alayhi salam, uh, brought the, uh, the tablets of the law uh, into the Ark of the Covenant, uh, there's this there was this uh, cloud that always followed the Ark of the Covenant, and this, that was a cloud of the, the, of the Shekhinah, the, the, the presence of God. And we know from various reports that uh, the Prophet was always uh, followed by a cloud, meaning that he himself is the Ark of the Covenant. He is the, the, he's the, he's the, you know, the madhar of God's attributes on earth. And the fact that he is then, you know, that he is the one who basically takes this position in the, uh, in the mihrab uh, has huge significance, right? Uh, or take, for example, calligraphy. I mean, the, the founding father of, the, of calligraphy in the Islamic civilization is Imam Ali, 
uh, all of the major schools of calligraphy, I mean, I practice calligraphy, uh, all of the major schools of calligraphy uh, go back to Imam Ali, either directly, uh, because he, um, he, of course, he, he wrote in the Kufic script, or through, and that's really interesting, through, um, you know, revelations or, or dream revelations. So, for example, Ibn Mukla, who was the man who, during the Abbasid period, codified the, uh, the Naskh and the Thuluth script by using the dotted system for the measurement of the letters, he was taught these scripts by Imam Ali in a dream. Uh, or, for example, Mirza Ali Tabrizi, who uh, created the, uh, who established the, the codification for the Nastaliq script, uh, he was taught the script by Imam Ali in a dream. So, uh, so this tells you uh, so much about the role of the Ahl Bayt in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, the Islamic arts. So it's really impossible to, to, uh, to, 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 make an, to, to, to take abstraction of the role of the Prophet and his family in, in the establishment and the creation of, uh, of, uh, of Islamic art. It's, it's, re it's usually important, actually. <laughs> and maybe by all different kinds of music and art, a person even can reach to high levels of spirituality or, or feel a certain spiritual experience, maybe even. Um, I mean, sorry. Um, yeah, music. Um, I mean, as you know, there's there's the dispute on that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, music definitely uh, for uh, for for a great deal of uh, of people from the mystical tradition has played an, an, an extremely important role. Um, and uh, I think there is the, these people have always made a very clear distinction between musica on the one hand and rina. Uh, rina is the thing that in the, in the hadith is, 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 is forbidden. And rina seems to have been a sort of very lewd and very vulgar type of music that was played during orgies, uh, you know, during, you know, certain, I mean, in orgies during the time of the, uh, during the time of the jahiliya. And that is, that seems to be what, what the Ahl Bayt were against. Um, and, um, and, but of course, there's other types of, of, of music. I think it's very difficult to put, um, you know, Mozart or Bach in the same category as uh, some vulgar type of music that was played in, in orgies at the time of the Jahaliya. I think it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's, I think the argument that, um, that certain people make against music is, is um, it, 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 does, it just doesn't make sense, especially not from someone who, for someone who actually studied musicology properly, it's it's just it's not um, it's not right. Especially because also when uh, when we look at our classical scholars, people like Hoja Nasruddin Tusi, um, you know, classified music as a branch of mathematics. And music is the uh, music is the science that established the relationship between two sounds, either in terms of frequency and that's melody, or in terms of rhythm. Sorry, in terms of time and that's rhythm, basically. It's a branch of mathematics. Uh, so the question is not so much music, but what you make of it. And music can actually be a very, help, uh, very helpful um, therapeutical uh, tool to, to uh, beyond spirituality, just for, for, for therapy. I mean, Ibn Sina and Farabi have written extensively on the therapeutical virtues of, of music and, uh, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe also we can consider the reciting Quran or du'as or anashid or even adhan or all the reading um, uh, sacred scriptures are all done by different alhan. We call it alhan. So it's a type of yeah, music. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I think, and, and I think one of the big problems of, uh, of the way in which our contemporaries uh, view religion, I mean, the, the second you view religion just as ideology, which is you know, Islam is not an ideology. and There actually is no place for ideology in, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, the, the second you view religion through the lens of modernity and you view it as an ideology and you separate it from, from you know, from uh, things like art, you completely miss the point. I mean, sounds, colors, uh, all of this have, you know, a great, a great deal of, 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 of meaning. Um, 
I mean, I uh, I'm, I'm very happy, for example, that you you know you you you're wearing your Omani outfits, and um, I wish there were more people like you because I'm I mean as a as a traditionalist, I always insist on the fact that uh, you know within the Darul Islam that we should wear our own clothes. I mean, it's something else. When when I go to the West, you know, I wear a three piece suit because that's you know that's uh, that's what I wear there. But when I am uh, within Darul Islam, I, I I wear clothes that are um, that uh, fit with the idea of the um, that are that are traditional, but also suits the the purpose of uh, of what Islamic clothing is about. I mean. Modern Western clothing is not suitable for for the practice of Islam. I mean, you know, and I know that, um, especially male clothing, uh, when men go into sujood, there are problems. I'm not going to describe it, but you know, and it's it's really scandalous that a lot of people within the Muslim world, uh, especially in Iran and also in other in, in especially in other Arab countries still can't get away from this um, form of uh, cultural colonialism. And when they think that it's not important, it's actually hugely important. And I'm going to tell you why. So uh, I told this to someone. Uh, I mean, actually, so you know, five years ago, I lived in Iran for a year, and, and I was asked to do a lecture on hijab. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, why? You know, it's like, don't you believe in hijab? Oh, I, I believe in hijab. But my problem is that um, it doesn't matter how many lectures I give on hijab because the minute that the, the lecture is finished, the ladies in the audience will go out and they will see in the streets that the men are all wearing Western clothes. And clothing, food, and architecture has such an impact on our unconscious, huge impact on our conscious. And we've very much failed to see how much our unconscious is actually influencing our actions and the way we look at religion and, and all other things, right? So I can, you know, you and I can have amazing discuss discussions on Erfan, on Falsafa, or whatever, but uh, if it takes place in a building that is, uh, is in, in a modern build, a, a building that is built according to the standards of you know, modern Western um, you know, architecture, we have, we have another person in the room, which is that, that, that worldview that is translated in the building and that is telling your unconscious and my unconscious that uh, 14th centuries of Islamic civilization were not good enough to give us a building with an Islamic type of architecture in which we could have this discussion. And likewise for the clothes. I mean, the clothes we're wearing all every single day. I can, you know, you and I can talk about Mullah Sadra or Mir Fendereski or, you know, Sheikh Ahmad Asai as much as we want for, you know, for, for days on end. If, if you and I are wearing t-shirt 24 uh, the jeans and t-shirts um, 24/7 whilst living in Qom or Tehran or, or Baghdad, the t-shirts and the jeans are going to tell us that 14 centuries of Islamic civilization were not good enough to give us clothes. That we needed basically Americans to give us um, this type of clothing. Uh, that is that is in the, and that is causing to cause a, a, a sort of schizophrenic mindset through which we have uh, you know on the one hand we have this very elegant you know thought system called Islam, but then the way we live it uh, is, 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 is is you know is going to be completely de de disconnected from that and and. Uh, it's a sort of schizophrenia that uh, has, I think, so far not been addressed properly by uh, authorities, be they political or religious, so far. <laughs> Great. Um, doctor, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about comparing between religions and searching for sp su superiority in a certain religion or another, 
uh, you mentioned several issues. One is related with religious experience and mystical experience where you can, we can mm. find it all over different people. And another, but before I ask you about the issue of pluralism and the issue of um, experience, there is an issue that you mentioned uh, when we compare, okay, we believe that there is a, a level of wisdom and beauty and pureness um, that is uh, manifested between uh, different uh, prophets and awliya and uh, great spiritual people and scholars uh, in history and in different societies. But then can't a person reach to a conclusion that uh, Ahlul Bayt or the Prophet Muhammad or the highest, uh, they reach to the highest level of uh, spirituality and thus we can believe that there is a superiority that exists in Islam or in Ahlul Bayt doctrine more than other. When we compare, for example, and I think you, you, you've worked on that in comparing the uh, idea of Qurban in Imam Hussein in Karbala and uh, compared with different Qurbans that happened in history and mm -hmm. religions. Well, here's, here's where we deal with here with the question of Imamology, right? Uh, are are the, the Masumin people who reached a certain maqam or are they uh, a tajalli, a manifestation of, 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 of the logos? And we're dealing here with, with imamology, imamological uh, issues here. Uh, I tend to be, uh, I mean, I, I share a very sort of what people call technically a high imamology. I, I view the Prophet and the Masumin as manifestations of, of the divine attributes, as Wajullah, basically. So, uh, so it's not for me, it's not that they've reached a certain level. They are that, they've always been that level, uh, you know. And um, of course, there's this, the, the, the imams, I mean, when I say the imams, I include the prophet in this. Um, they, have a, a, they have a nasut, of course. They have a, a human dimension, a human nature. And they have, but they have a lahuti dimension as well. And of course, the nasuti dimension is, it's a, it's a perfected humanity. And that perfected humanity, of course, prays, worships, and so on and so forth. But it's a perfected one. And, um, and that is, I think, the very um, elegant way in which the, the, the um, you know, the, the, in which the Ahlul Bayt are, 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 are seen. They are the face of God in direction to its creation, but they also, they're also the face of creation towards, towards God. It's, it is, it's this very, in, 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 terms, in terms of their humanity. And so, yes, I think, um, you know, the, 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 uh, in terms of, you know, the way I would look at the imamology, I, I, would, I'd see them, I would see them as manifestation. Of course, you know, um, according to our understanding of, of um, you know, uh, sacred history, they are, you know, they are, they are, they are the culmination of, uh, of the manif of the, you know, tajaliyat through sacred history. Um, and, and that is how basically it's in there, the culmination of, of, uh, of all of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then that does not forbid people in other religious traditions to have some sort of marifa of, of the, of, of the divine. And of course there's a, there's discussion amongst the Arifa, uh, uh, regarding this issue. I mean, uh, can people who are Buddhists have marifa of, of gods? And if yes, up to what level? And you know, and 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 so that these are these are the, the, these are these are these are important uh, discussions. For me, of course, it goes without saying that you know, as as a Muslim, I view the Ahlul Bayt. I mean, I view the Masumin as the uh, as the highest form of, uh, of tajalli, as uh, in terms of madhhar, basically. And even uh, including the, the idea of a um, perfect being in Sana Kamil and the al uh, yeah, Muhammad, yeah. the Muhammadan reality, yeah, Muslims, yeah, yeah, you can say yeah. that they are in the top and all other prophets and uh, great people that uh, they are manifestations yeah, yeah. of the yeah. Uh, Muhammad. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. In, in a sense, I mean, if, if, you know, if, uh, if we take Islamic architecture, I mean, the, 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 the prophets and, and the, 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 the Muhmineen and the awliya become this, you know, this the mirror work that reflects the lights of, of the uh, of the of the Haqiq Muhammadiyah, most certainly. And uh, you know, then you know, that's I mean that's how I would uh, view it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
Uh, and then we can say that the, the other awliya and the, they are all spread uh, in different societies and religions and they are manifestations of this, the, the Muhammadan reality. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, uh, I mean, for example, you know, as I, as I, as I give you the example of, you know, Kobo Daishi or, 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 or Dogen in Japan, I mean, how would they have known about, you know, the, the, the Islam in the first place? And yet they... In their lives, they embodied, uh, you know, many of the the virtues of the uh, of the uh, army of the intellect, uh, especially compassion. Um, there's a was well, one beautiful thing I, I really like about Mahayana Buddhism, which is the, the Bodhisattva vows. Uh, the fact that uh, you take a vow that everything you do is for the uh, salvation of all beings. Uh, be they humans or animals or uh, whatever, and so when you when you eat, when you sleep, when you meditate, uh, it's all with the intention of of you know of of um, of having a selfless love, of being a conduct of rahma, and of course this cannot be inspired by by none else but the source of rahma, which is which is which, which is God. Theologically speaking, it might or it may or may not be well articulated, but uh, in terms of, but there's no denying that uh, you know there's something there that um, you know is in is in sympathy with the teachings of, uh, of the master. Mm, okay, um, Doctor, some say or believe that uh, the idea of uh, the perfect being, the Muhammadan reality, the the asma in its high level of presentation. Um, they say it's, it's, it's exaggeration, it's qulu, it's mubalagha, it's like presenting a, a small god. It's something that we can't even uh, imagine. So you're talking about a being that's controlling all the angels and all the different worlds. So um, this is something that is beyond uh, any normal human being. We can understand a prophet who receives uh, revelation, who has some miracles, who who is a very superior spiritual person, but uh, not in a level which is uh, controlling everything else uh, other than God, which is a full manifestation of God. It's something like the idea of uh, Christianity, which is uh, God is existed in a certain era of time. So what do you believe in this? Uh, well, I think, I think one of the big problems is that, you know, people are, people first of all need to read more, you know, uh, and I think, unfortunately, people don't read enough. And they don't read enough, um, especially of the of the relevant material regarding these questions. Um, there seem it's it's very often it's it's posed in sort of this binary idea of well, either the prophet is some sort of special postman who gets a letter from Allah and then distributes it to human beings, and that's that's it. It's a very sort of uh, it's a very sort of Jewish way of of, of looking at things, although. Judaism is a bit more complex. I mean, especially when it comes to mysticism, it's a bit more complex than that. But it's a caricature here, or it's you know, uh, or it it becomes this uh, you know this this, or it gets the idea of the Hakikah Muhammadiyah gets sort of uh, conflated with uh, the idea of hulul in in, in Christianity, uh, which which is not the case. I mean, the the it's it's very clearly laid out the. Uh, the Hakikah of Muhammadiyah is, is basically the Wajullah. Like the essence of, of God is forever, uh, you know, veiled. And uh, this is my cat, by the way. Uh, the essence of God is always veiled. And, and, uh, and so the God reveals about himself a certain number of attributes through what you know, when the, this veil of light that is also his face, the uh, you know, the, the, the Waj Allah, which has this double function of revealing what God states about himself and also veiling his sacred essence. So, in a sense, the uh, the, the Haqiqah Muhammadiyah is actually the guardian of Tawheed, of the absolute Tawheed. Without, without it, uh, because you have these two. You have these two tendencies. You have tashbih and then tanzil, right? And these two extremes. And the 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 the, 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 
either you go into, you know, this anthropomorphic vision of God having a body and having his left foot, you know, uh, on, on, on hellfire in Jahannam, or you have this very sort of, uh, you know, almost agnostic way of saying, well, we, we don't know exactly what God is, but, you know, and, and there's this intermediate way. And the way of securing the, uh, of making sure that God's secret, uh, that God's secret is forever, remains secret, but at the same time, that the validity of uh, that of, of a self-revelation remains sort of like you know, valid, is the idea of Mahakika Muhammadiya. And and the problem is this: is that I think that uh, people don't take the time to actually study things properly. Uh, these are very subtle points of, uh, of mystical theology that demand a quite, you know, quite a great deal of, uh, of inquiry and, and reading. And I think most people, I mean, especially the Shia community, is a, it's, a, it's a community of listeners. Uh, it's not a community of readers. I mean, you know and I know that, uh, you know, people don't buy books, right? I mean, rarely, except if they're studying at the Hausa. But uh, the, the you know, common people just sit in the majlis and, and they listen and they will not study. And the problem is this, is that, you know, people don't study. And, uh, and even when they study, um, as I said, the, the unconscious is, is very much, uh, you know, being contaminated by, uh, especially nowadays, by modern ideas. And there is this tendency nowadays to demystify religion. So that, you know, the, the prophet becomes a social activist. Uh, Imam Hussein becomes uh, the Islamic Che Guevara uh, and so on and so forth. And then the role of the, the role of the Masumin just, just, you know, that they, instead of becoming, of, of, instead of being what they were always supposed to be, according to the Hadith, Wajullah, uh, Nurullah, the, the, the manifestation of, of God's attributes, they just become these, you know, really good social activists uh, that, you know, people can then use to gain uh, brownie points with the radical left in the West and uh, help, uh, you know, and uh, participate in, let's say, not very ethically, not, not very, um, how to put it, you know, the two parties made in very dubious political and uh, games. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for sharing all this information. I think we reached to the end of part one. And then in part two, we'll discuss a uh, little bit more about uh, pluralism and uh, uh, mystical experiences and uh, some ideas of Henry Corpan about uh, the imaginal world and, then, and uh, about Islam and ideology also. So we'll continue mm -hmm. our discussion, inshallah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.